Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda. Hello and welcome to Future Energy Talks with me, Andrew Wilson. When it comes to clean energy solutions, hydrogen has been talked about for decades. But has its moment finally arrived as a carbon-free solution, particularly in the most challenging sectors like concrete and steel? Stay with us to find out. Touted as the low-carbon miracle to power everything from air freight to factories, hydrogen looks like it's about to reach its potential. Many companies are investing heavily now in hydrogen projects. Mazda, our sponsor, has been leading green hydrogen production across the Middle East, and many more companies are following. But do the challenges of affordability, safety and distribution still have to be managed? To discuss exactly that, I'm joined now by Matthew Knight, Head of Market and Government Affairs at Siemens Energy UK. He's also chair of the government's hydrogen production group. Matthew, good to see you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. First of all, you work in the uh, hydrogen space. Give us an idea of its importance and indeed its potential. Well, often when we talk about the energy transition, uh, the first thing we think of is renewable electricity, wind and solar. Uh, but actually three quarters of all the energy that we use on the planet today is not in the form of electricity. It's in the form of chemical fuels, things like oil and gas. Uh, and we use those because they're easy to store and to transport. And we used to think that they were cheap because we didn't recognise the cost that they were having on our environment. Now we know we have to stop that uh, and we have to replace those with something clean. And that's where hydrogen comes in. For a lot of applications, hydrogen is a clean alternative to those chemical fuels. That's because we can make it with renewable electricity in an electrolyzer and the ingredient is water. Uh, and when we use it, it doesn't release greenhouse gases. Well, you say hydrogen has got a big role to play in the future. Where do you see those uses playing their part? Well, hydrogen has a wide range of potential uses, uh, some of them more valuable and more urgent than others. So the first place to start is replacing hydrogen where we use it at the moment. In order to make fertilizer, we need ammonia, and we make ammonia with hydrogen and nitrogen from the air. And today, the source of hydrogen is fossil fuels. So globally, fertilizer manufacture is responsible for about one and a half percent of greenhouse gas emissions at the moment. We need to get rid of that, and one of the ways to do that is with green hydrogen. Let's deal with the issue of expense then. It's always traditionally been thought of as expensive. Is it still expensive? Well, it's getting cheaper. If you're looking at hydrogen that's produced in an electrolyzer, the cost of the energy that goes in is maybe 80% of the lifetime cost of producing energy. And as we know, the cost of renewables has fallen spectacularly. I was a bit of a pioneer in the UK's offshore wind industry, and we've seen the cost of offshore wind here come down faster and further than most of us, even in the industry, hoped. So it's fair to say now that governments in different parts of the world are looking at the possibilities and seeing how their infrastructures and their markets will be able to cope with that. The UK seems to be lagging behind Europe and the United States, to be fair. Has there been a hesitancy in, in London? I, I don't think I would characterise it that way. Uh, the UK was among the first to uh, set targets for hydrogen. Uh, I think the difference is that the UK has spent a few years working on a business model, a kind of market incentive for delivering hydrogen, and that's ready to go and the first projects are now going through that. What some of the other European countries did was, as well as working on things like that, they directly subsidised some early projects to get early experience and start building a supply chain. I suppose it's also about targeting where you're going to deploy these different potential renewable energy sources or green energy sources. Uh, some companies now, energy companies, are saying that domestic boilers, for example, can be adapted to hydrogen use. Is that a realistic infrastructure to set up in somewhere like the UK? It's a possibility, but uh, most of the, uh, the engineering studies that have looked at it see um, hydrogen for home heating as, as a pretty low value use. Um, far better to use a heat pump. Uh, a heat pump will give you 200, 300 percent more heat output than the electricity that you put into it, whereas a boiler is always going to be less than 100%. Uh, the idea of reusing existing gas pipes sounds attractive, 
Um, but you have to remember that hydrogen is a much smaller molecule than natural gas. So if you, if you designed your pipes to keep natural gas in, they may or may not be able to keep hydrogen in. For example, if, if you put ketchup in a sieve, it'll sit in there, but if you put water in, it just goes straight through. And that's the sort of thing that we need to look at uh, with repurposing existing natural gas pipes for hydrogen. Well, you sit in at the heart of the decision making. You talk to ministers, you talk to civil servants. Where are you pushing for hydrogen to be deployed? So there are lots of places that we know we're definitely going to use hydrogen. And the first and the most obvious is replacing hydrogen where it's used at the moment. So around the world, Production of fertiliser is done by putting hydrogen together with uh, nitrogen to make ammonia. And the hydrogen for that comes from fossil fuel sources, and it's responsible for about 1.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we're going to need fertiliser to feed 10 billion people on this planet. We need to make fertiliser in a clean way. So replacing dirty hydrogen with clean hydrogen is top of the list. But there are other things that we'll need hydrogen for as well. There are some heavy transport applications, there are certain chemical processes, uh, things like making steel, uh, and it's going to be very important in energy storage. A couple of projects that Siemens Energy is working on at the moment in partnership with Mazda, for example, also Total Energy is looking at sustainable Aviation fuel, is this a realistic possibility? It's a very realistic possibility. Uh, and we're working with those two companies on some pilot projects uh, and the challenge is scaling up. Aviation is possibly the, the hardest industry to decarbonize because at the moment it's, it's an international industry, so it's outside the juris jurisdiction of any particular government. Uh, it burns a million barrels of kerosene a day, uh, and kerosene is very easy to deliver to any airstrip anywhere in the world. So we need an alternative fuel that's relatively energy dense and relatively easy to move around. What about the geopolitics of all this, these troubling issues of dependency, which we've seen, of course, in Europe in recent years, but also security. Where do energy sources like hydrogen play into the geopolitics of distribution and sales and supply? Well, hydrogen, is a game changer for uh, geopolitics of energy. Different countries will be have advantages in making hydrogen uh, locally. So hot, sunny places are a good place to use solar power to make hydrogen. Uh, windy places like the UK are super places for making hydrogen. And those countries are going to be different from the ones that historically produced the oil and gas. Uh, but we will still see trading of energy around the world. Maybe it will be in the form of hydrogen in pipelines. Maybe it will be in the form of hydrogen derivatives like ammonia or uh, e-methanol uh, or we talked about sustainable aviation fuel. What about the, the rollout, the deployment of, of hydrogen as an energy source? I mean, we've seen in the renewable sector with wind and solar, it's a combination of incentives, of entrepreneurial enterprise of government uh, subsidies sometimes, but a way of nudging the public in a certain direction. What about hydrogen? What sort of conversations are people having about getting ready for people to understand and maybe make use of hydrogen? Well, the nice thing about hydrogen is it has so many different potential uses. There are lots of different people with lots of different business ideas who are trying to make those work. And yes, there's an important role for government in providing subsidies, pump priming, research and development support. Um, but we, we have several projects already on the go completely without subsidy. I was involved in kicking off a, a small startup company uh, called Geopura that does effectively a hydrogen equivalent of a diesel generator. Uh, and that is working quite well without any subsidy at all. Uh, and it's, it's using hydrogen to provide uh, off-site power supplies for people like the film and television industry or construction sites. Those are customers for whom the cost of energy is relatively small in what they do, but the value of being green is quite important. So they are early adopters of hydrogen. And what we'll see is, as the industry grows, as the costs come down, which they surely will, just as they did with batteries and wind turbines, um, it will open up new use cases and more customers will be able to afford hydrogen. And so the industry will snowball and it has to grow 10,000 times bigger than it is today if we're going to make a difference to climate. Energy storage, that's an issue now. Where, where do we stand with energy storage? 
Well, energy storage covers a wide range of things. We, uh, we need to sometimes store energy just for a few minutes, and a battery is great for that, or for a few hours. But if you're getting on to days or weeks, you need to somehow store it as a chemical that you can convert back uh, to electricity when you need it. And there's an interesting study that's recently been done by the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering, where they found that one year in 40, you need 20% more storage to satisfy the energy needs of this country than the other 39. So somebody's got to uh, produce a chemical, store it somewhere, and keep it locked away until you absolutely need it and you've got nothing else left. And that's a, an interesting challenge uh, for governments in the future to, uh, to find out ways to do that. Are we making any headway with that? We are. There's a project that's being developed in the UK uh, between Equinor, SSE and Siemens Energy is involved called Oldborough Gas Storage. And it's an existing salt cavern which today stores natural gas, but in future they're going to use this big hole in the ground to store hydrogen. And the hydrogen will be made with renewable electricity from one of the offshore wind farms off the east coast of England. We'll pump the hydrogen at pressure into the ground, and then when it's needed, when the wind's not blowing, we'll let the hydrogen come back out and it'll go through one of our gas turbines to make electricity. Let's take a step back and, do, and look at some of the, the science in this. I mean, we talk about blue hydrogen, we've already mentioned green hydrogen. What are the differences? And what's the pluses and minuses, particularly of blue hydrogen? Well, they both produce hydrogen, which superficially it's the same product, but actually it has different customers and it's done on different scales. So in green hydrogen, we take electricity and we put it through an electrolyzer and we split water into hydrogen and oxygen. We can release the oxygen into the air and when we use the hydrogen somewhere, it will recombine with oxygen and we get water back. So it's a completely sustainable process. And that's attractive um, to lots of different customers, particularly those who really want to be green. And blue hydrogen is more of a chemical process. It's made in very large chemical plants. And we do something called carbon capture and storage. So we take a fossil fuel like natural gas, and we strip the carbon off and we bury the carbon, and then we're left with the hydrogen. Uh, that process can only be done at large scale, and you need to have a place to put the carbon dioxide. So it's a different kind of process, it's a different scale, it's different kinds of customers. But that's really valuable for, say, a chemical plant who at the moment is using fossil fuel. Um, they can reduce their carbon emissions by 80% by using blue hydrogen. So different customers, different uses, but the same end product. Matthew, let's look at carbon capture. You mentioned carbon capture earlier on. Carbon capture and storage, what are the applications of that and how can that be used to decarbonize, particularly heavy industry? Well, if you want to clean up a process, you can either put a clean thing in at the front end or clean up the emissions at the back end. And carbon capture and storage is about cleaning up the exhaust. And that might be the exhaust of a power station or a chemical plant or anything else that's releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at the moment. The way it works is you have a, a, a chemical process that separates the carbon dioxide from the stream of the flue gas. Uh, and then you pump it at high pressure into a big hole in the ground somewhere, like an exhausted oil and gas field in the North Sea. And that's what the UK government is planning to do with its big programme for carbon capture and storage. Can you see a time down the line where we're actually going to be scraping the carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it and taking away the bits that we need and hiding away the bits that we don't? Well, people are already doing that on small scale in various pilot parts around the world. Um, from an engineering point of view, it's easier to start with um, a more concentrated source of carbon dioxide. So, for example, on the back end of a power station, the exhaust gas of a power station might have 15, 20% carbon dioxide in it rather than 450 parts per million in the air. So, carbon capture from existing chemical and energy type processes is a good place to start. The other alternative is biomass. We grow a crop that captures the carbon from the air as part of the growth of the uh, whatever the crop is. Uh, and then when we use that crop in some way to make biofuel or we combust it, um, the, the carbon is released. But if we capture it, we've then got a way of uh, actually making a sort of negative 
a way of capturing carbon and releasing energy. So realistically, what's your vision about how hydrogen will introduce itself to industry, to the public, to go further, to make the growth that you talked about a moment ago? Well, I think as we see this industry grow 10,000 times in a decade, and don't, you know, I'll say that quickly, but it, that is quite a challenge, uh, we'll see the uses change and we'll see the customers change. We'll obviously see the costs come down as well. So for blue hydrogen in the UK, we already have a number of projects which are just waiting to hear whether or not they've got a, a, a government support contract. Uh, and they will start building in the next year or so, and they'll come on stream maybe 2027, uh, around about then. But they are big blocks. You're talking gigawatt scale in one particular project. Uh, green hydrogen will start with small projects, and we're already seeing those, and the projects will get larger, and the number of projects will grow, and we should, both blue and green, get to around the sort of five to 10 gigawatt scale for each of those industries by the end of this decade in the UK. I mean, I still think of hydrogen as a, as a, as a, a niche market and a niche technology. Am I, am I behind the curve? It is today. And I think whenever someone's talking about hydrogen, you need to clarify, are you talking about it this year, next year, or five years time? We are on that massive ramp up learning curve. Uh, and it, it is going to be big. Um, the, People will argue how big, but it's going to be big. Are you optimistic? I am optimistic, but also I look at climate change. We, we use as a, 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 around the planet 100 million barrels of oil every day. We've got to replace that entire infrastructure with a clean alternative by the middle of the century. And so hydrogen is one of the things that's going to help us do that, but it, it's only going to be valuable if it gets to that sort of terawatt scale in the next 10, 15 years. So I'm optimistic that it can play its part and we need it to go as fast as it can. Matthew, that's fascinating stuff. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Matthew Knight there. Well, hydrogen, just one possible step on the road to a greener future. For more insights, listen to our other podcasts in the series. Join me, Andrew Wilson, for more future energy talks. And of course, subscribe now. Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda.